Welcome back. I hope that uh, everybody is uh, not uh, tired enough and we can continue. Uh, now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor uh, Jerry Bocco uh, from United States of America, a distinguished oral uh, pathologist. Uh, uh, he has received many awards, many international awards, including the St. George National Award, the highest award given by the American Cancer Society for lifetime efforts in cancer control. We are all very happy and excited to have Professor Boko uh, here in this uh, webinar. And uh, we are uh, now, uh, Jerry, we, have, we can see now your uh, slides and uh, we are ready uh, to listen to your uh, lecture. I'm sure uh, your lecture will be fantastic. So uh, here from uh, Tehran, Iran, we go to the United States of America to Professor Boko. Thank well, you thank you. Much. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sifar for really a wonderful presentation. And uh, hers is really complicated because her topic is really complicated. Mine is kind of simple, so it'll be um, a different, different kind of a presentation entirely. Uh, first of all, let me check. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is my microphone yes. working? Okay. Yes, I can hear you very well. All right. Well, I'd like to explain a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, my face doesn't look this red and blotchy all the time. It's just uh, that that is it's just part of my uh, setup here in my home office. Uh, the other thing is, let me smile for you. Do you see? I broke a tooth and it's, I'm going to have an implant uh, put in tomorrow, but uh, in the meantime, you have to put up with me lisping every once in a while. I apologize for that. Well, I, uh, for those of you who do not know me, I've been around for a while. I started oral pathology in uh, Minnesota, which is in the North central portion, right on the Canadian border. Uh, and uh, that was uh, back in about 50 years ago. So I've done a lot. I've given a lot of CE talks and I've done a lot of research and really enjoyed it. And I have to admit that when I retired about eight years ago, uh, I found that oral pathology was a wonderful hobby. Um, and I don't have to be able to um, do any jogging or golfing or anything like that to be able to do it. So um, I am very much uh, attuned still to oral pathology and I still give lectures here. I moved away from Houston where I was for the last 10 years of my career. And uh, we came back to the little mountains near Washington DC called the Appalachian Mountains. And I really love these mountains. Um, there, those of you who know about hobbits, you would be very well, well at home here in these little mountains. But uh, I was here for about 20 years, 30 years actually, long, long time ago, beginning in 1975, and I, I didn't leave for Houston until 2004. I have been uh, president of the American Board of Oral Pathology, as uh, some of you may know, and I've been, I'm just the person who kind of works in organizations pretty well, so I have been uh, in many, many of these. I want to say that, um, whoop, let me double check this. If you'll see uh, all of my PowerPoint lectures are sort of like websites. I have hyperlinks or links, uh, standard links down in the lower right-hand corner. And of course the arrows go forward and back. And uh, this uh, arrow, the curved arrow will bring you one step, one slide back to the previous slide. And if you go to the home, then that will bring you to the first slide. And uh, let's go there for now. Oh, I did want to uh, say, by the way, that one of the uh, one of the great joys I've had, and uh, it really is an honor, 
to be a co-author of the Neville book. Uh, I, Brad Neville was one of my students here in West Virginia, in the West Virginia mountains at West Virginia University. And he and a couple of other mutual friends, Carl Allen and Doug Dam, um, I asked them because our Schaefer, Hein and Levy, which in India has been updated, but in America had not been updated in a long, long time. I asked these three guys to write a textbook because I knew they were among all the oral pathologists in America, the ones who saw a lot of clinical patients as well as I have done in my career. And I wanted the book to be written by people with that experience instead of only microscopic experience. And they finally did it uh, only because I, I, they wouldn't do it unless I offered to um, help them. So I became the fourth author and then, of course, when I retired, I uh, left the book, and the edition four is uh, with another fourth author. But um, it is it has almost from the very beginning been um, certainly the best-selling textbook uh, in oral pathology, but uh, the first two years that it came out in the mid-90s, it was also the best-selling textbook in all of dentistry in the U.S. It shows you what a void there was uh, that needed filling. And it's gone on to become certainly the most popular oral path textbook ever published. For those of you who uh, may know me, most of you do not, of course, I want to uh, emphasize that even though I'm an old guy now, uh, I was young once. And uh, for those of you who are young, I just want to remind you that uh, that picture on your right is what's gonna happen to you. So good luck with all of that. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor, uh, may I ask you to uh, change your slides into full screen? It's not full screen, but uh, I think it would be much better if uh, you show us in the full screen mode your slide. Okay. Now there is an icon in uh, the right. I see an icon that says share. Uh, no, no, uh, here uh, you should uh, do it on your uh, computer. You know, you see um, a screen, something like a screen at the bottom of uh, your PowerPoint. Oh, I, I am on uh, my presentation mode in PowerPoint. You are uh, in presentation mode, but uh, we can see uh, it's not full uh, size. It's not, okay, it's not a major problem. Uh, you can continue it. Uh, well, hmm. Let me see. It's like one show. more. Uh, let me try one more thing. Uh, you know, you see a slide show in the top of uh, your PowerPoint. Select the slide show, maybe it could be. Uh, you'll have to repeat that, please. You know, uh, you see the slide show in top of uh, the, your PowerPoint. Uh, here's written slide show between uh, animations and review. Maybe if we click it here. Oh, yes. Now you can see it better? Uh, and now you can uh, select uh, from beginning, yeah. Then choose it once more, and then uh, you should select from beginning, I think. From beginning, if you select from beginning, I wonder. Okay, I, I think it's not a major problem. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, you can continue, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, one of the audience has suggested F5. Uh, please uh, uh, push F5 on your computer. F5 to go to full screen. Uh, 
And somebody says they can't see the screen at all. Uh, but we can see you here, I can see your screen. Uh, probably, uh, uh, Professor, you can continue. Uh, How does that work now? It's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Well, I, I'm not sure. Um, that's never been a problem with me, so I'm not sure what I've done. But um, let me just uh, get on with the discussion then. And I wanted to point out that um, Dr. Safar was talking about the malignancies, and it's a very complicated topic, uh, those especially in the head and neck area, there, there are so many tissues of origin in the head and neck area that it is um, actually one of the most difficult areas, I would say. But my topic uh, is going to be all of those little reactive lesions. She talked about uh, the kinds of things that are going to cause us to spend a great deal of time in our practices, our pathology practices, coming up with a proper diagnosis and we have to know about all of that in order to even know what to do. And uh, what I'm talking about is less complicated, but also we have to kind of know about the whole group of entities because it's complicated in its own way. However, these are only the reactive things and I have decided not to, the, the topic is too broad. So I've decided to make it primarily uh, soft tissue masses that occur in the mouth. And uh, I've called it strange bumps and odd lumps. And that's only because I'm an American and we just talk funny and we have to have funny different topics. I wanted to point out uh, if anybody wants this presentation, you're welcome to uh, send it to give it to me, just send it to my email. And I will put that up uh, again in a little bit. But as part of the presentation, these are the entities, the specific entities I'll discuss. We may not get to some of these others because I've all my life had a bad habit of putting too much information into a presentation. And uh, that's why I've always given out my uh, presentations. So uh, these are the topics. And as I said, it's like a website. You can just press on a button and you will get to that particular topic. And that is available. Um, just by emailing me, I will give you the Orpoan, maybe I can give him the, uh, the link. So I'm going to be talking, first of all, a little bit about just how common these things are. Typically um, in medical pathology, you're only looking at the microscope and you're, you really only see tissue that comes primarily to hospitals. And those are kind of a unique referral bias. In uh, oral pathology biopsy services, uh, we get all the easy stuff, um, but we have to know a lot about clinical information. And in fact, if I compare the, a biopsy request form from a physician to one from a dentist, we get way more information from a dentist, but it could be uh, because we're just sort of anal retentive, I'm not sure. Um, let me just say that, um, this is a topic that was very near and dear to me. If we go to how frequent it is, I will explain why. But I just wanted to say right after that, I'll get into just a very brief discussion of kind of the tissues that are involved. And uh, then I think there are two or three basic types, uh, actually four, if we extend it out, of background information. Um, many of the lesions, these reactive lesions, have a fibrous background, of course, and that's because the fibroblasts uh, in, in the healing process of some trauma, acute or chronic trauma, they have gotten the signal to make collagen, but they don't get the signal properly to turn off that collagen production. Same is true for granulation tissue. Uh, it just doesn't move into that healing phase, and so we have many lesions that are masses that uh, are granulation tissue or more vascular in their background. And then dentistry is really, really well known for putting a lot of stuff into people's mouths and um, foreign stuff. And so I have a, a series of reactive lesions that have not always foreign material, but just something different that is not very commonly found in the other lesions. 
So let's look first of all at how common these things are. I wanted to point out that uh, this is from one of the very first, uh, actually it was the first year of the first dental journal ever published in 1839. That was at a time when they put the patient's name and uh, um, they didn't put the phone numbers in the journals, but you could, you could tell who the patient was. They put the age and all, of, all kinds of personal information, which we're certainly not allowed to do anymore. But this was an 18 year old woman. And this was 50 years before, uh, this is a pyogenic granuloma, a pregnancy tumor. And this was 50 years before any dermatologists ever proposed this uh, name for an entity called pyogenic granuloma. So dentistry has been interested in these kinds of problems for a long, long time. Uh, even though oral pathology, uh, sorry, my arrow is pointing to the wrong place. Even though oral pathologists uh, really didn't come onto the scene until the 1930s and 1940s. I also wanna say, if you wanna have some fun times, just put funny mouth or something, Google funny mouth, odd mouth, strange mouth, and you'll get some really weird pictures. Uh, people on the, the web have um, really gotten into it. But I wanted to show you uh, something that is kind of important. Uh, we're looking at uh, something, these are masses that are reactive tumors. And I had for my master's thesis a long, long time ago, um, I had the records and I actually examined many of these for uh, about 32,000 adults in Minnesota, in the middle of Minnesota, mid the middle of the United States. We had good records. By the time I published this, uh, we had good records on about 24,000 or so individuals. And this is many, many times larger than uh, any other prevalent study. And this was uh, really, really good because we had oral pathologists and oral surgeons at each one of these local small town uh, examinations, mass examinations. So the data is uh, very, very accurate. It represents about 70% of all the adults in these communities. However, it's a Minnesota at that time was a lily white uh, community. Uh, so we don't have much in the way of black or brown kinds of individuals. So this data should be relate, relative to white individuals and individuals above 35 years of age. But look at what we've got. The number is- Sorry, you... Professor. And yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, the audience are uh, saying that they can see the, uh, your presentation file, your slides in full screen mode. Uh, I want to help you to change it to full screen mode, if you uh, let me. Okay. Uh, on the bottom, on the right side uh, of your PowerPoint, beside the minus, you can see the minus, yes. Oh, on the left side. Um, actually, on the right side. Well, on my right, I've got index of lesions and the buttons. Mm. Uh, are the words are the words backwards? Is that uh, I I don't know I did did uh, a slide that we can see is in your PowerPoint and uh, there is a bar on the left side uh, which shows other slide as well. We cannot see your uh, slides in full screen mode. But the, yeah. the only thing I guess uh, you should do is uh, go to the top menu, uh, a slideshow menu beside the animation. Okay, let me get out of full screen. Slideshow I've got. Yes. And then I guess uh, from the big, Oh, okay. Or from the current slide. Yes. Is it full screen now? No, unfortunately we cannot see in full screen. Wow, why is that? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, uh, the audience are watching from uh, the mobile phone. 
you know, uh, the, we can only see the bar uh, that uh, when you go to the slideshow, the a bar is open, and we can see. Um, we can see uh, you cannot click on, uh, you did not click on the uh, from current slide. You only uh, put your mouse over the bottom. Is that better now? Is that bar missing? Professor, would you click on from current slide? Would you click on from current slide? Please click on. Please open, yes, please open again. And from current slide, please click on the left, left side, please. No, no, sorry, the other side, the other side. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, yes, click on, click on. From the beginning? Yes, click, click. Do you get the full screen now? Not yet. No, unfortunately. Would you click on it again? Let me let me stop sharing and I'll start sharing again and see if that works better. Okay. No, maybe. Well, it looks as if I have two copies of this here. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Is it yes. yes, great. Now it's good? Great, great. Thank you. OK. Thank well, you. then uh, let, let us get back to what I was sorry. I apologize for all of that. There we go. Uh, my button was working a little slow. I just wanted to point out that these reactive lesions represent a large, large part of what is sent to an oral pathology biopsy service and what is seen in the mouth. If we look at a huge number of individuals, at least uh, white males and females uh, who are older than 35 years of age, we'll find about 6% of these will have some kind of a reactive mass in their mouths. Part of that has to do with the fact that we put so many artificial things in the mouth that uh, we create a lot of this. And another part has to do with the fact that we have teeth so close to soft tissues. And uh, the third part is that we have a form of reactive lesion that we don't really think of as reactive, but uh, we'll talk about that toward the end, but um, they're bony masses, and in long bones, these are really, really uncommon, whereas in the mouth, they're very common. We'll find it in maybe three out of 100 people in, uh, in the adult world. So um, I don't think those of us who are dentists uh, really have appreciated the fact that these are reactive lesions because of stresses that are placed in the mouth on the bone for various reasons. And uh, it's kind of a unique environment, the jaw bones. Then all these inflammatory reactions are often dental, dental, denture related or they're related to local inflammation. And they are influenced, uh, the pyogenic granuloma I showed you as a pregnancy tumor. Um, in our department way back when we showed that actually the estrogen receptors in a pyogenic granuloma, the gingiva, are really, really high in numbers. So uh, there is uh, maybe a greater influence of estrogen on such lesions. We also have lots of hundreds of salivary glands in the mouth. They get traumatized. I'm not really gonna be talking about that, but that's three out of every uh, thousand individuals. And then we do have tonsillar tissues. We all know about the pharyngeal tonsils, but we have little tonsil tags. I call them tonsil tags all over the mouth. And uh, sometimes they get enlarged, hyperplastic, and can get two, three, four times larger than normal. And uh, those of you who, who are in medicine, I'm sure don't know about this, but in the cheek, we have uh, about maybe 10 to 20% of us will have a lymph node, uh, buccinator lymph node, and sometimes that becomes large. Compare all these numbers, 60, well, 61 we'll say, so 
six out of 100 individuals will have some kind of a reactive mass compared to the malignancies that are found and the benign lesions that have, are found in the same group. The biggest caution, I guess, that I can uh, give to everybody is that squamous cell carcinoma ranked number 25. We only found 53 total unique lesions in this group of um, 26,000 individuals, but uh, number 25 was squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, the lips, was up there in number 52 or so. And uh, I put in yellow all of those entities that are fibrous reactive and, and vascular reactive lesions and bony reactive lesions. And altogether, it's 30 out of those 53. And you see the first, maybe out of the first seven, uh, six of them are reactive lesions. So in the real world, in people's mouths, this is something we all have to be on top of. And uh, it's something that we all need to be aware of, but fortunately, these are primarily benign and pretty innocuous entities. They just come up with um, in biopsy services and require us to know a little bit about them. So this is in the uh, this is on my website, uh, and it also is in uh, my Boco to Go uh, Dropbox file. And you can get this. I said, as I said, anytime you want from me. So that's available, and I even put, by the way. Um, an index of lesions, uh, I've already talked about that, so let me get back. Sorry, I got thrown off there by uh, the, the technical glitches. Well, what kinds of masses do we have in the mouth? Um, Dr. Safar talked about the different kinds of surface presentations, and that was very, uh, that was very astute to be aware of all of that. We have a wide variety. I put this in an article of mine a long time ago, papillary, fungating, mulberry, sessile, pedunculated. And uh, these are the kinds of words that the clinicians send to us on the biopsy request forms. And it often is very, very helpful. Uh, remember, we're just looking at one piece of tissue, very thin, and uh, who knows exactly where on the, the uh, lesion that piece of tissue came from. A lot of, at least in our country, a lot of the uh, biopsies are cut by technicians and they're, they're not aware of all of these different pathoses. We have other entities, ulcerated, and if you have a combination of ulceration and mass production, then we call that fungating. And of course, uh, some masses are pigmented uh, in the mouth. We worry about that because malignant melanoma, people just don't survive malignant melanoma in the mouth. Uh, it's not like the skin where the prognosis has improved dramatically over the decades. But so we biopsy a lot of benign pigmented masses in the mouth. Most of them turn out, we know they're going to turn out to be benign. And most of them are really some of these other masses that just happen to be occurring in an area where the patient has, we call it physiologic pigmentation, racial pigmentation. Um, and normally that's a, a flat uh, macule. But of course, sometimes you will develop a mass in that area. And epulis is a pretty unique thing to the mouth. By definition, it means a mass on the gums. And so uh, that's something that uh, those of you in medicine are not at all familiar with, I'm sure. Let me uh, just talk about, I don't think I have to talk about the different types, but we do have a lot of multinucleated giant cells. Uh, sarcoidosis seems to be a, pro a problem that we've been seeing more and more of. Of course, any kind of squamous epithelium has to be non-dysplastic. Most of the things we are going to be looking at will have a collagen background. Some of them will have other soft tissue backgrounds and some will have ground tissue uh, processes associated with them. Um, it says the slides are not changing. Is that happening for everybody? Let me change the slide. Did the slides change? Uh, no, uh, I see just the slide with soft tissue types products and probably, oh no, no, it's uh, changing. Now we have lungs, have many sources. I see this slide. 
Okay, so I guess it is taking a long time. I'm not sure why. Um, I'm hooked into a landline here, so it should be a good signal. Probably but it's a little delay between what you see and what you have here. But now okay. I think it's okay. All right, well, let me switch it again one more time. Now, do you see a title slide with round bumps? Uh, I see the uh, slide with the title, Fibrous Hyperplasia, the round bump. Yes. Okay. All right. It's working. I apologize to people for the delay in uh, the slides coming up. They're coming up instantly on my, um, my screen. Let me double check something here. Okay. Well, okay, let's look at the uh, fibrous hyperplasias. Primarily, uh, fibrous hyperplasia, I'm assuming, starts as a, a proliferation in one little spot and then uh, just keeps on enlarging like a benign neoplasm would do. So typically, it's going to be a rounded structure, and even an irritation fibroma is the most likely uh, entity, sometimes called traumatic fibroma. It is a reactive fibrous hyperplasia. And uh, if I see even a little indentation, so it looks like two lobules, I start to wonder if maybe it's another entity. And some of those would be the benign entities of fibrous origin. But let's look at that. Uh, I'll talk while the uh, slide is opening up for you, but I just want to point out that scar tissue in the mouth is remarkably uncommon. Uh, we have, uh, it's the 18th most common lesion, but considering that everybody has really sharp teeth, broken, jagged teeth, teeth missing so that soft tissue gets stuck in between them, I would expect all of us to have some kind of scar tissue in their mouths. And um, I just don't see that. And so I guess uh, most of the time, if you're going to have a mass production in a, in a scar, it's sort of like a keloid, as we see in the lower right-hand picture, keloid of the skin. We, that is just not common. Most of these in 18 out of uh, the 18th most common oral lesions, most of them were flat, just pale areas of discoloration with obvious kind of jagged borders. So it looks like scarred, a scarred area. Uh, but maybe one-tenth of those were elevated above the surface. But nevertheless, they will be removed probably because the patient needs is biting on that elevated area. Like a lot of these benign entities, the surgeon knows what the entity is or has an idea of what it could be, but um, they just need to get rid of the mass so that somebody can eat or speak again. Sometimes because of continuing trauma, they're, they're ulcerated, they, they're painful or tender, so they may be symptomatic. But um, I think the thing that protects us is uh, saliva. Uh, it's a good lubricant and it also has IgA. It's uh, always got a certain number of neutrophils and lymphocytes in it. And uh, that's the only thing I can think of. It protects the mouth from having all of these other issues. So, if there is somebody with one of these, uh, keep in mind that they may be painful, even though we never see the nerves inside of them. And uh, removing them, we know that the removing them is going to almost always get rid of whatever the local pain is. So I don't know how that works either, but it does work. Uh, surgery has proven that. And also, if you have somebody who's getting multiple scars, think about this disease, scleroderma. Uh, these are people, of course, as you know, who continuously add, add uh, more and more fibrous tissue throughout their body, and uh, they especially uh, have problems in areas of trauma. And uh, we do think of, even though the irritation fibroma is a form of scar tissue, hyperplastic scar tissue, it's got this rounded structure. It just doesn't seem to be um, it, what we think of as a typical scar. So we've given it a different name long, long time ago. It's found in uh, 12 out of every 1,000 adults, and it's just very, very dense, as you see in this middle lower picture. It is something that uh, you, I have been amazed at how this tissue can even stay alive because you seldom will even find a blood vessel in this tissue. 
you will find uh, some congestion and maybe lymphocytic uh, infiltration beneath the epithelium, but that's because of every once in a while continued trauma. You can imagine how difficult it is to chew when somebody has a mass like this, uh, their buccal mucosa. And I told you that sometimes we have pigmented masses. Here's somebody who just happened to have a dark brown macule and it became even more dark uh, as the mass developed under it. But microscopically, it's just uh, dense collagen bundles, very avascular, and there were melanocytes up in the surface. I wanna say also that in the mouth, uh, melanocytes tend to release the, their melanin particles into the underlying, immediately underlying connective tissue. We call it um, melanin incontinence. Uh, it's a dermatology problem as well, but don't be surprised by that. It's not any kind of an uh, invasion. And of course, I mentioned that some of these are ulcerated on the surface and microscopically you might see that. And it's just a routine ulcer, but you wanna check the edges of the ulcer to make sure that we have something uh, that is not dysplastic. Well, uh, we're in the mouth and I told you Dennis put a lot of weird things in people's mouth. Uh, somebody asked, by the way, I just checked the chat room. Somebody asked if, these, if this kind of scarring occurs in other mucosal areas and uh, there, it can occur in vaginal mucosa, for example, but it's really, really uncommon there. Um, keep in mind, uh, we're the only mucous membranes with really sharp, jagged, hard structures next to them. And so uh, you would expect a lot more. But here's one form of irritation fibroma that is very, very 100% created by dentistry. And uh, if we have a denture, people wear dentures for 20, 30 years, they get loose. The bone of the alveolar ridge uh, naturally shrinks over time, even if you have a nice denture fit to start with, eventually it will become loose. And if the new denture is not made periodically or the denture is relined with a, a softer plastic material, then uh, if you do happen to develop an irritation fibroma under it, it can't grow. It grows sideways. It's certainly not gonna grow into the plastic. And if you lift them up, there is a, a little indentation under almost all of them. And if you looked in the sinus, the bone would be actually a little bit uh, uh, exophytic or bulging into the sinus. And uh, it's not a really big deal, but you see when I pulled this particular leaf-shaped um, fibroma down, uh, there's a little pale area right here. And that's because this is all fed by one blood vessel. And if that thing flips down when a patient takes a denture out to clean or takes it out at night, and then they put it in again afterwards, and this gets flipped around, then you just cut off the blood supply. And so this might be something sent to you. It's, it would be either totally necrotic or partially necrotic. I even had a patient, I think it might've been this one, who uh, it really, she smelled like, uh, her breath smelled like a dead body. Um, it just was really, really horrendous, uh, just because this was a necrotic lesion. And this one I could just pull off with my fingers. No problem. Typically, they're easy to remove. You just take a scalpel, slice through the uh, leaf, and this indentation will fill in over six months or so. Another thing that makes it look like a leaf is um, on the flat edge, there are typically tiny little edematous bulges. We get edema of the connective tissue papillae, and uh, clinically, it looks like the, the outside edge of a leaf. So leaf-shaped uh, fibroma is just an irritation fibroma that grew in a place where it could not grow in its normal structure. Another similar thing, which was the 11th most common oral lesion is on the edge of a denture, especially in the lower jaw. Dentures get very, very loose over time. And it comes to be a, it comes to be a uh, different entity from the leaf-shaped fibroma. We seldom see the leaf-shaped fibromas uh, of the lower dentures because they tend to just be more mobile, I guess, than the upper ones. But what happens is as the denture gets loose, it keeps pounding into the edge here. 
And uh, we develop an irritation fibroma along the edge that's constantly being traumatized. On the surface, we can see these edematous little um, enlargements of the connective tissue papillae. And uh, here's one that is, uh, has a lot of that. We have a name for that. We call it papillary hyperplasia, and I'll discuss that in a moment. But it does look a little bit like a leaf-shaped tumor, but what happens is eventually it gets big enough so that the next time the patient puts a denture in, it, uh, the ridge is shrunken down, and now there's a little empty space under the denture, and this flops under the denture. And then we start developing another one and another one. And I've seen as many as five ridges like this, like mountain ridges, because of that phenomenon happening. And the old name for this is redundant tissue, which kind of makes sense. And this is the only one I've seen like this. This was, uh, it, I called it an epulous fissuratum, but it's almost a leaf-shaped fibroma. But it got so large and it was so floppy that it, it really just hung right over the alveolar ridge and uh, crept down the opposite side. So very easy thing to remove. And the uh, problem is it's a two-part treatment. You have to remove the lesion and you have to do something about the denture to make sure that it doesn't um, um, recur again. And I'll talk about it in a moment, but these papillary hyperplasias of the surface, they're very edematous. They look like little blisters in the first few months, maybe even the first few years. But as time goes on, they will fibrose and they look like tiny little irritation fibromas. Um, there is a problem with uh, this entity that uh, problem has to do with the ability of the epithelium of the gingival tissues and alveolar mucosa the tissues to produce really long Reedy processes. And uh, this is a structure that when we get it um, in the lab, it's just natural to take a scalpel and cut it from one end to the next. And we can have Reedy processes that are so long that they're almost touching from one side to the other. And now we've just cut right across that. And it looks like a little island of, or a bunch of little islands of squamous epithelium that can be misinterpreted as squamous cell carcinoma. So um, the, I'll get back to that, that epithelial change in just a little bit, but I wanted to continue on this uh, business of uh, fibrostromas. The irritation fibroma looks like scar tissue, very acellular, very avascular, and it's really easy to make a diagnosis. Nobody worries about it when they make a diagnosis of something like that. But sometimes you'll run into one, and uh, Hannah discussed this in her lecture, that is more cellular. The cellulars take on a streaming or fascicular uh, uh, nature. Sometimes you'll see pretty dark nuclei, sometimes large nuclei. You'll see a little vascularity. Sometimes we'll even have erythrocytes outside of the blood vessels. And you may or may not see some lymphocytes scattered here and there. It is uh, something that normally doesn't have mitotic activity, but I've seen some that I've called fibromatosis rather than a malignancy with mitotic activity. So uh, this is more active, I guess is the best way to discuss this or describe it. And uh, we just don't know whether that's a true neoplasm or it's a reactive lesion. Right now, we are kind of up in the air with that and we just um, leave it at that. Sometimes it's many decades before we ever come to a conclusion about what causes certain lesions. But this is a mass, it is different from the irritation fibroma in that it's often lobulated, you see here. It gets much larger than an irritation fibroma. It grows more slowly and it continues to grow. An irritation fibroma grows to a certain size, whatever size it wants to be. And then it will stop growing and will not increase in size even with additional trauma over time. Whereas fibromatosis, it looks a little more aggressive microscopically, sometimes alarmingly so, sometimes we wanna call it a low-grade fibrosarcoma, but uh, that's why the name aggressive fibromatosis is added to it. However, it will continue to grow and uh, very, very slowly, but it will continue to enlarge. So if you have the clinician there and the patient can say, yes, this has been going on and enlarging for years, 
then you know it can't be an irritation fibroma and you're almost left with nothing else except this diagnosis. The more aggressive ones in, in this category tend to be in younger people, first two decades of life. And so juvenile aggressive fibromatosis is one of the formal names given to this particular entity. And uh, it is very uniform, just like an irritation fibroma, you might see a little more inflammation up here beneath the surface uh, under the epithelium. But if you get down into the middle of it, it just looks like a very sort of a, what we call a grade one half fibrosarcoma. So that is a, what you have to rule out if you're going to call something an irritation fibroma. And keep in mind, we have fibrous hyperplasias that can be very generalized. The gingival tissues are made up of fibroblasts that are a little different character, uh, different uh, fibroblastic types. Maybe that's the reason the, the gingiva is uh, very prone to this sort of thing. However, keep in mind, this is also probably the most inflamed area, chronically inflamed area in the human body. Uh, there was a study of stroke victims uh, some time ago, maybe 20 years ago, and uh, they looked at infections in the body in the stroke victims. And it turned out that having an infection somewhere in the body within 30 days before the stroke was a, the number one cause in their study case um, uh, case controlled study, it was the number one cause of a throwing a stroke, a throwing a clot in the brain. And uh, they further went to identify where the, the um, infections were and 80% of them were oral, oral and uh, maxillary sinus. And probably about 80% of all of that, those two groups were oral. So um, for those of you who are in medicine, you might not be aware of the fact that uh, for several decades now, we've been making more and more correlations between systemic diseases and uh, kinds of periodontal infections. This is a unique form, however, uh, not necessarily associated with that kind of infection, but the slow grade and low grade infection produces all of these, this inflammatory hyperplasia, and it just keeps on enlarging and the years go on and on, and you can actually get so bad that it will cover the uh, entire, all the teeth. So it can be inherited, it can be drug induced, especially by the anti-seizure medications, or it can be just, it develops and you can't tell why it develops, but keep that in mind. Microscopically, it looks like irritation fibroma it may have a little bit of chronic inflammation. This one doesn't have many, but look at these long reedy processes. I measured one once in a uh, hyperplastic gingival case that was over a centimeter long, one reedy process. And keep in mind, if you happen to cut this, cut through some of these, when you cut through your tissue sample to look at it microscopically, it could look like islands of squamous epithelium down deep in the stroma. And maybe that's why uh, it's better for dentist, dental oral pathologists to have um, uh, all this clinical information given to them by the surgeons. So we have, uh, by the way, a, a phenomenon here in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of insurance companies that require dentists to send their tissue samples to um, large medical labs. And uh, since they're not, I uh, wouldn't expect them to be really up on all of the entities associated with oral lesions. They often uh, would send the oral path labs in this country uh, referrals, uh, second opinions, and we're happy to do that. But um, there aren't too many oral pathologists I would think of who would not recognize the tissue samples I'm thinking of, even if they didn't have that, that uh, clinical history. Well, I talked about papillary hyperplasia. Actually, it's called inflammatory papillary hyperplasia. It's the 15th most common oral lesion. And here's a good example of it. This was a, a patient who had a problem like I have now. Uh, the tooth was broken out. Here the tooth is missing, so they made uh, what we call a flipper, a retainer that has just one artificial tooth to fill in the hole. And typically that's only a temporary thing until the patient can afford to get the whole thing fixed, but this was after many years. And because it got loose um, and kept pounding on the mucosa of the palate, we developed these kinds of small little bumps. And microscopically in the early period, even clinically, they look like blisters. I call them chronic blisters. 
and they're scattered. They like to grow right here along the, uh, the curve of the hard palate and right in the midline, but they could be anywhere. And they're very, very edematous. They could look almost like clear mucus fluid. And uh, there usually is some good congestion and there may or may not be a lot of chronic inflammatory cells. And then as the months and years go by, they start to look like irritation fibromas, just lots and lots of little irritation fibromas. And this patient just happened to have a leaf-shaped fibroma for comparison. And microscopically, as you would expect, it's just more fibrotic, less vascular. This one happens to still have a fair number of lymphocytes in it. Uh, that just means that there probably is a secondary infection because this kind of tissue is very prone to a secondary candida infection or mixed bacterial infection, and that causes the, this inflammatory response. So this is a good example of a really late one. This has been going on for about nine years, according to the patient. We have a few lymphocytes in the fibrous stroma. We have a few dilated vessels left over, and we have some really long Reedy processes, and they tend to be intertwined on the hard palate and on the gingiva. And so we see some, we just happen to cut some in cross-section. And if you're not careful as a pathologist, uh, if you see a lot of that, then you're going to wonder, is this some kind of a benign low-grade squamous cell carcinoma? And quite frankly, I have probably a dozen times in my life gotten tissue samples from medical pathologists for a second opinion, and it was just that phenomenon. They wanted to know if it could possibly be cancer because it just didn't look like it. There was something off. And I admit that there is something. I can't really explain it. Well, another way you can have all of these tiny little irritation fibromas is on the dorsum of the tongue. We have filiform papillae, which are typically uh, pointed and mostly made up of a thick layer of keratin. Uh, and it's no big deal. They have very few taste buds on them. They come and go. Uh, they can be influenced by diet, nutrition. They can be influenced by physical habits, like rubbing your tongue against the uh, upper teeth. But some people are born with uh, these, these bumps, these filiform pointed papillae as large masses. They're not large compared to the normal size of a filiform papilla. And the large mass can be, look like an irritation fibroma very easily. They can be clustered together or they can look like this where the whole tongue seems to be involved. And sometimes we'll get a little bigger one. You see one here, you see one here. And so the, the mass if, is biopsied. Typically, these are not biopsied. So uh, sorry, I, I had to stop to look at a chat there. But it, microscopically, it's going to be a classic irritation fibroma. It may have a little more congestion and chronic inflammation of the surface because it tends to be more anterior. It tends to be people who are mouth breathers rather than breathing through their nose. And uh, mouth breathers in particular, some of these bumps can do enlarge more than others. So that when the biopsy is done, we have an irritation fibroma essentially. You're gonna be tempted to call it that. There may be a little more inflammation, chronic inflammation near the surface, but it's not, not a big deal. Uh, sometimes see, we almost have a pyogenic granuloma appearance near the surface. It can be that vascular. So uh, this is not the fungiform papillae. For those of you who are not familiar with the tongue, they're, they're, for every many hundreds of filiform papillae, there's one rounded one that could look just like these little bumps. Those are the fungi, fungus forming kind of fungus looking kinds of papillae. And that's where all the taste buds are. But this is somebody who had filiform papillae that ballooned out. They don't tend to have that edematous period beforehand. And I think it's just a congenital tendency to produce this. And then somebody has a tongue habit of rubbing against the teeth or they breathe through their mouth because they have nose obstructions and they develop uh, these kinds of fibromas. Chronic lingual papulosis, I was the first one to report this and I had to make up a name and it seems pretty good. Um, so that's, if you do call one of these an irritation fibroma, I think the surgeon, uh, the dental surgeon, oral surgeon is going to understand uh, that it's really not that, it's one of these kinds of entities. 
no problem. It just happens to be something that um, we just haven't reported on until recently. And also sometimes the, these are filiform papillae. You see the size of them. They're not quite as big as uh, in chronic fungiform or chronic uh, lingual papulosis, but sometimes these are the taste buds. Remember, these are the papillae with the taste buds. And the more primitive cells, the neuroectodermal cells, as they're traveling to the area where they're going to become a nerve, some of them, all of them have to decide, am I going to be a melanocyte or am I going to be a nerve? And sometimes they get confused, especially in people who have dark skin. They tend to have melanosis of the mouth, patchy melanosis. It's usually flat and not pot spotty like this, but if it is spotty, it's probably only going to be on the tongue and it, it'll be the very top of the fun, fungiform papillae. It's just something that causes issues. If you only have one, you might get it in a biopsy service. And then we'll see routine melanosis and maybe some melanin down here in a melanophage beneath the surface. Just another odd thing, not really a reactive lesion, but something that can look like a reactive lesion. And I, let's talk about these fake cancers. Um, if you know anything about the politics that we've gone through in this country, the word fake is all of a sudden blossomed and uh, become a real part of our vocabulary. So we have names for the, this particular entity. We call it, somebody just guessed it, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia or proliferation. And the entities I've talked about tend to have those in high enough frequency that at one time in my early years, the the papillary hyperplasia, as we see in this middle picture, the upper picture is microscopic of the same thing. Um, I This was called, considered to be a precancer until we did a fo few follow-up studies and none of the, these funny looking epithelial drops or islands really became anything. And uh, there's never been a papillary hyperplasia case that went on to cancer that I am aware of. Um, Somebody just asked about the papillary tip melanosis. Could it be induced by medication and smoker's melanosis? I should have mentioned that. Yes, indeed. It's in my original paper. Some of them, it developed after they started smoking. And in two of them, I think it developed after they started medication. And it wasn't medication that typically we think of uh, that induces melanosis. Okay, to get back to pseudoepithelioma hyperplasia, um, there again, in the epulis fissuratum, as we have in this uh, lower left picture, the problem is a little different. It's not that their epithelial proliferation is so strong, which it is, it's a kind of a characteristic of papillary hyperplasia, but it's the fact that this is a tall, narrow mass and you're gonna cut through it and you're, it's gonna look like you've got some invasion into the surrounding tissue. So the thing to do, of course, is just to cut a little bit off to the side and make another slice. And uh, of course, oral pathologists were very used to this. We're very used to pseudoepithelioma hyperplasia. And I don't think we tend to do that. At least I have not tended to do that. And I did want to point out that sometimes, very, very rarely, we will have true pseudoepithelioma hyperplasia all by itself, just sitting there. And uh, it doesn't happen very often, but I've, I think I've only diagnosed three or four out of maybe 140,000 biopsies, oral biopsies that I've uh, personally diagnosed. Well, something else has happened. Number one, uh, if you look at the stroma surrounding this uh, massive pseudoepithelioma to hyperplasia, and you find these either rounded or in this case, linear kind of spindle shaped uh, foamy cells, uh, granular cells more than foamy cells. These are histiocytic looking cells. We used to think, and I think the picture can tell you why, we used to think it was a muscle origin lesion, but it really is a neural origin lesion. And it is, uh, it's called granular cell tumor. We wanted to, call it something else, granular cell hyperplasia, granular cell this or that. And uh, in, I, in half of a century, I've not run across a better name, unfortunately. So let's call it granular cell tumor. And then we will uh, just, something you have to do. 
okay. Uh, there was a chat uh, question there, and I will get to that in a moment. But uh, so if you're going to diagnose pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, or if you're going to diagnose cancer, you have to look around for these granular histiocytic looking cells. And if they're there, then your diagnosis, I won't say is guaranteed, but it's almost guaranteed to be fake cancer. It's a pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And one place that we've known for many, many decades where this happens with some frequency is the middle of the tongue. The tongue is produced by a process that comes in from the right and a process that comes in from the left and a middle process, the tuberculum impar. And that middle process, just before the two sides fuse together, it embryologically scoots down and the two sides fuse together. But once in a while, the timing is off. So we're left with an area that should not be exposed. And so it's not covered by papillae. It's a bare spot in the midline exactly, usually in the posterior, sometimes a little more anterior. Well, this is prone to get secondary yeast infection and yeast infections in, in when the candida gets embedded in the epithelium, it tends to stimulate epithelial proliferation. And so we can get this kind of pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And in the 20 years I was at West Virginia University, my office was in the pathology department in the medical school and I had an appointment in that department. And so I knew them very well and all of the oral lesions the residents would bring to me to confirm their diagnosis. It was really a, just a courtesy, but three times in that uh, 20 years, they brought me what they had called squamous cell carcinoma. And it was this uh, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia in a median rhomboid glossitis. And we just stained for yeast and we saw it and that was the end of the, the diagnosis. But keep in mind, this is probably the rarest, the most rare place in the whole mouth for a squamous cell carcinoma to develop especially in the midline. And also keep in mind that uh, if you put a yeast, uh, anti-yeast medication in the patient's mouth, I usually went with topical, but you could use a systemic one. Uh, this would tend to either disappear entirely or become very small. And so the problem, the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, if you were to biopsy it again, would also be greatly diminished and may even be back to normal. A more recent thing that has happened with the same problem is uh, osteonecrosis. We have developed about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, a, well, actually we started using them 40 years ago with um, osteoporosis drugs. But about 20 years ago, we started using drugs, these oste the, the uh, bisphosphonates, you may know them as biphosphonates or diphosphonates, they're all the same thing. And it turns out that they really, really kept metastatic bone cancers in place. So they started to be used very, very successfully in breast cancers, prostate cancers, multiple myeloma. I'm sure you all know about that particular phenomenon. Well, one of the side effects of that is in the mouth, especially under dentures where there's this mild trauma. We end to have, we tend to, if you look at the mucosa surrounding this tissue. And by the way, this is not bisphosphonate. This is a cocaine. And that's another entity that I was the first one to report on because I, in Houston, we just happen to have people with these lesions, their teeth got bashed out and the bone was exposed for months and months and months afterwards. And uh, it just so happens that uh, we got some to tell us honestly why. And they said, well, that's where I put my cocaine powder. And so uh, we know that, and, but like all osteonecrosis with exposed bone, if you look at the surrounding tissue, it's not so inflamed. Um, and microscopically, when you look at it, you see this epithelium that can go down half a centimeter or so. And in this setting, <coughs> pardon, I have to take a, a, my medication. It's a piece of candy called a Tic Tac because I have a very dry mouth from my, uh, one of my heart medications. So, but this is really unusual for pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and it's almost a, a sure sign of malignancy. So I can see where people would be confused, but I presented a series of eight lesions like this and uh, six of them had chunks of dead bone totally surrounded, just engulfed by the epithelium. 
but it wasn't squamous epithelium. So it was, um, it's just something to keep in mind. In these particular settings, uh, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia is a very, very common issue. Okay. I've got uh, an emergency signal on my phone here. If you hear a sound in the background. And I'm kind of stressing the fact that we have microscopic examples of malignancy and you have to be aware of that. And sometimes it just, you have to send the slide around to many people there. We've tried to come up with uh, microscopic uh, markers that would separate these. Doesn't seem to be very much research on that, but uh, so far they haven't been particularly helpful. But I wanna also stress that squamous cell carcinoma is the 25th most common lesion, as I've mentioned, but they don't all look bad. They don't all look ugly. They don't all look dangerous. Here is one that looks just like these irritation reactive types of hyperplasias that I'm, I've been talking about. And it turned out on biopsy to be squamous cell carcinoma. And this is one of the uh, wonderful pictures I've gotten off the internet. If you look at it, you don't know what it is until you see the little people riding bicycles, bringing these pods to market. And you just have to look closer. That's the whole lesson of that picture. And looking closer in the mouth typically means doing a biopsy. Well, I told you I, if an, I had an irritation fibroma, but it was lobulated, I would wonder very seriously about whether it could be an irritation fibroma. And typically it's gonna be this. If you have, it, sometimes it's so lobulated, it actually looks like a papilloma. And microscopically, they don't have large pointed bumps. It's not verruciform just blunted almost like a, a condyloma, um, an HPV lesion. Well, in this case, so everything looks the same, except there are two features that are same as an irritation fibroma. There are two features that are just really unique. One are these really long reading processes, and the other are these fibroblasts. They look really big, they're angular, the nucleus is often pushed off to one side, or you may have multiple nuclei in them, and uh, they typically seem to cluster right under the epithelium, but you can find them down deeper. We call these simply giant cell fibroblasts. And it, it means that this is an entity that's no big deal, but it kind of, um, if you don't have the total structure, you kind of wonder about uh, fibrosarcoma because these cells can look weird. They actually look more to me uh, like the fibro, fibroblasts and fibrocytes in people who have been irradiated fairly recently, but Nevertheless, um, these are, once you're familiar with this, it's pretty easy to make a giant cell fibroma diagnosis. And uh, it really doesn't mean anything except that this has a higher recurrence rate. Irritation fibromas probably seldom if ever come back. Whereas these in some studies are 10 to 15% recurrence, but they just come back. So it's not really a big problem. If you do happen to see one of these microscopically, then look at the patient's age if they're under 20, 25 years of age, and it comes from the site right behind the anterior lower teeth, then it looks just like this, but we tend, these are developmental anomalies to disappear almost always in adults. And we call it retrocuspid papillae. Looks the same microscopically. So that's the only real distinction. I've had one patient uh, with two of these on the uh, retromolar pad area behind their, their wisdom teeth on the bottom. And uh, they were giant cell fibromas, but they were bilateral in exactly the same place. So maybe that's kind of one of these phenomenon, phenomena associated with genetics. Well, then of course, if you happen to have something that is not dense, what do you call it? We've discussed nixoid lesions. I think for a pathologist, it's pretty easy to see that. We get focal mucinosis in the mouth, probably more than on the skin from the papers, at least, that I've read. And it's not re really encapsulated at all. It's just a very loose, kind of a purplish look to it. Uh, not very cellular. Has a few blood vessels that are more prominent than you would expect with an irritation fibroma. And they, they can get to be uh, fairly large. This is about the largest one I've ever seen. And so oral focal mucinosis is an easy enough diagnosis to make. I don't think we even, I've never even used special stains on them. 
but we have some special vimentin positive and S100 negative if you want to use that. We don't know what causes these. We think it's an overproduction of hyal hyaluronic acid because that's what we see um, when, when this tissue is analyzed, but we don't know what produces all that extra hyaluronic acid. So um, I think our assumption is it's either some kind of chronic inflammation or repeated trauma. But as far as I know, none of our oral examples have been part of any uh, systemic disease. Now, the next category is fibrovascular, and I'll try to get through those a little more quickly because we are running out of time. And Puan, you'll have to just uh, speak up when I, and it's time for me to stop. This uh, is a pyogenic granuloma, very uh, old, well-known entity. More recently, about 20, 25 years ago, the dermatologist said, well, you know, these have this uh, lobular appearance with fibrosis around it. So I think these are actually forms of hemangioma. And so let's call these uh, locular or lobular capillary hemangiomas. And in oral path, many of us have taken to that. Quite frankly, I'd say about 75% of the pyogenic granulomas I see, there is no lobular pattern to it. So I still stick with pyogenic granuloma. And if it has that lobular pattern, I will put lobular capillary hemangioma in parentheses. It's pretty common or pretty uncommon, I should say. Uh, you would expect pyogenic granulomas to be more common, but also keep in mind, clinically, these things look like cancer. And so the clinician gets worried. And I think unlike irritation fibromas that are left in place because they're innocuous, they're easy to diagnose clinically. We have um, pyogenic granulomas, I think are always biopsied. So Uh, somebody just asked if uh, there's any definitive marker to separate oral focal mucinosis from soft tissue myxoma. And I honestly don't think that there is. Um, I would have to look that up, but I do not think that there is. Okay. Well, the big place of inflammation in the mouth, uh, not the place of trauma, but inflammation is a gingiva. And that's where we get all of these. If somebody is pregnant and they have gingival inflammation, they have a very strong risk of getting one, two, three, four, five of these kinds of entities in their, on their gingival tissues. But they're all still pyogenic granulomas. They're strongly influenced by estrogen, as I've told you. We have another entity where my department found the same thing with uh, peripheral giant cell granulomas. And uh, if they're strongly influenced by pregnancy, that kind of makes me think that maybe periodontal uh, ligament origin is more prone to this estrogen influence. But we didn't really do an analysis of anything but gingival tissues. Another thing is uh, these things are in, uh, it's sort of a poor healing response, as you can imagine. And if you pull a tooth, you're going to have some people who have poor healing. Some will have a dry socket, very painful. Others, uh, three or four weeks after the tooth is extracted, you look in the mouth and you see this mass coming out of the socket. And typically you would think it would be pyogenic granuloma, but mostly if you look at it microscopically, it will have multinucleated giant cells and it will be a peripheral giant cell granuloma. But clinically we call all of these masses that grow out of sockets, benign ones, we call them epulis granulomatosis. It's just an old term. We don't really need it, but uh, it's still in use because it's a clinical term. There's no way somebody can look at one of these in a socket and say which of the, well, there are a few ways, but I'm not gonna discuss it, uh, which of these are those entities. And I'll talk about all of those in a moment. Somebody mentioned CD34 is positive in most soft tissue myxomas. I was thinking about that but I don't know if it's positive in uh, focal melanosis. I mean, focal myxo mix, <laughs> focal myxoid lesions. Uh, okay, to get back to the pyogenic granuloma, since uh, we have trauma and infection going on so often in the mouth, we have different clinical entities. Some of them were placed even before we understood what was going on microscopically. 
But pregnancy tumor is just a pyogenic granuloma that develops at the time of pregnancy. Typically, we look at it and we'll say, well, let's wait until the baby's born and then wait a few months afterwards because it will probably shrink down, may disappear entirely. But at least if it's smaller, we won't be doing so much harm when we cut it out. And it's not so unusual for somebody who does not pick up good oral hygiene between babies to have um, pyogenic granulomas, pregnancy tumors, multiple times. Epilus granulomatosis, I've told you, just a poor healing response. We go in and curate it out and uh, scrape the walls of the socket and generally it does not come back. If you have an abscess tooth, uh, typically in long bones, an abscess inside the bone would go from one end of the bone to the other and perforate all kinds of holes in the cortex and may require and often will require a, um, a cutting off of the limb or the extremity. But in the mouth, it's something, something weird happens. The pus goes directly to the closest cortex and eats a hole in it and comes out and creates a little pyogenic granuloma on the surface. We call that a parulus. Uh, people generally will say gum boils, but it, they're typically pyogenic granulomas. And the only difference is if you happen to cut it just properly, then you'll see a little tunnel of pus going from the bottom to the top of that. So uh, it is best to treat the tooth instead of the uh, pyogenic granuloma. But I have had several cases where the pyogenic granuloma developed because on the face because there was drainage to the face rather than into the mouth. And uh, one of those, it was a fellow who could not afford dentistry. He was a PhD candidate, just was too poor uh, paying for his school to go to a dentist. And so he went to the uh, university dermatologist who just kept cutting out what he called a pyogenic granuloma and uh, literally went on for five years until he got a job and went to a dentist and the dentist said, oh, you've got an abscess here. So the, one of the lower incisors was treated endodontically and the, the skin lesion cleared up. So keep that in mind. It may be, it, it may, it may be that um, this pyogenic granuloma of the surface is actually a response to pus from the inside of the tooth. And then sometimes if we look in back in the lower right, uh, people will have the upper teeth pounding onto this area of tissue and it will become inflamed and look like a pyogenic granuloma. We call it a pericoronitis. Uh, it's the same kind of a thing. You may have pus, but usually is not. And then also uh, if you have an open apex to a tooth, and it gets abscessed and the tissue is destroyed, but there's enough vascularity in the root for some of that uh, pulp tissue to remain alive, then it can proliferate and we will get literally a pyogenic granuloma inside a tooth. Usually it requires a large part of the tooth structure to be destroyed by the tooth decay, but uh, it is not a pulp tissue anymore. We call it a pulp polyp which is terminology that goes back a long way, but as you can see, 1847, but uh, it, is, it is all pyogenic granuloma. It's all granulation tissue. What makes it might throw you off if you're not used to it is squamous cells, uh, keratinocytes from the saliva will settle onto this mass in the tooth and will cover it. It's a very good Petri dish apparently for those cells. And so you're gonna get something that looks like it's part of the oral mucosa with little granulation tissue under it. And then one thing that happens, uh, pyogenic granuloma is granulation tissue, irritation fibroma is dense fibrous tissue, pretty avascular, but sometimes a biopsy is done while a pyogenic granuloma is becoming an irritation fibroma. It's becoming more and more fibrotic over time. And if we get the biopsy, then it's going to look like something different. It, yes, we have dense fibrosis, but we'll have dilated vessels. We'll have increased numbers of vessels. We may see endothelial, endothelial activity with these plump endothelial nuclei. And so that's a little different from a normal irritation fibroma. And I didn't feel comfortable calling it either one. So I just, uh, for many, many decades now, I've been using the term fibrotic pyogenic granuloma. It's something that happened to get caught halfway between the two. Well, another thing you should be aware of is if pyogenic granulomas, since they're soft on the gingiva, 
they're stimulated by um, irritation, chronic inflammation. Um, however, once they form, they're, they're covering the tooth surfaces. And so we have, a, the patient has a tough time keeping those teeth clean and it just compounds the problem. So it's like a catch 22. You, one thing is producing the other thing, which produces the first thing, which produces the second thing. So it's always a good idea, uh, especially for gingival lesions to remove them just to allow the patient to be able to get to good oral hygiene. Um, it isn't really something that we have to treat, but as I said, because it looks like you can't rule out a malignancy with uh, many of the appearances because they're ulcerated on the surface and they may be even hemorrhagic. Uh, so biopsy has to be done. And uh, that's, that's a pretty common entity in an oral path biopsy service. And then uh, we have also things things that Dr. Safar has mentioned, uh, she talked about Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, I just generally call them immunoproliferative masses and they're in people who are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed. They're kind of pyogenic granulomas, but of course the Kaposi's sarcoma is a malignancy. And yet if you treat for the virus, um, they all go away. And as a matter of fact, Kaposi's sarcoma used to be maybe uh, weekly, maybe a couple times a week, I would get one in my oral path biopsy service of maybe six, 7,000 biopsy samples a year. And uh, I don't think in the past 10 years, I've gotten a single Kaposi sarcoma, uh, past 10 years of my career, not my retirement. But um, in the early years of age, these were frequently the very first sign that the patient had AIDS. And of course, microscopically, I won't get into that because Dr. Safar discussed that. The other thing which you're seeing more and more of nowadays are, it's called different things, but post-transplant immunoproliferative disorder is probably uh, the more common terminology. And of course, this, as the name implies, is going to have a lot of lymphatic structure to it. So it won't be uh, so much fibrovascular, but clinically, it certainly looks very much like a, a very large uh, pyogenic granuloma. And uh, don't I didn't put a picture up, but a Kaposi sarcoma can look very much, uh, there's another entity that looks just like it microscopically and can look kind of similar clinic. I mean, uh, microscopically can look exactly like it clinically and somewhat similar microscopically. And that is bacillary angiomatosis, also seen in AIDS patients, but that's a bacterial infection and staining for bacteria would give you uh, the information you need. And those of you who are not in uh, oral pathology um, may or may not be aware of this phenomenon. I think it's still pretty exclusively an oral phenomenon. What happens uh, is somebody gets a trauma, they bite a piece of tissue and it goes, they bite deep enough so the muscle is involved. And if you injure muscle, then uh, these muscles will be, in, in, they'll be coated by eosinophils. It took us forever to know whether the eosinophils were damaging the muscle or were trying to heal the muscles, but I think it's pretty clear now that they're there to help. But uh, eosinophils, you should know if you're not an oral pathologist, we almost never see eosinophils in the oral cavity. There are only a handful of entities and most of them are pretty uncommon. Uh, so it's just not, not a, a, an issue. Uh, it's just not something we see. Mast cells are the same. We just don't see much in oral lesions. So if you had add a few eosinophils to something that looks like otherwise a standard subacutely inflamed ulceration, uh, then you're going to be in a whole different category. A traumatic ulcer is what we call something even if, it, even if it's deep. Sorry about that. Traumatic ulcer is sort of the standard ulcer. Um, we never get biopsies of them unless they don't heal. And that's why we tend, uh, in my experience, about half of them turn out to be Tugsies. Tugsy is traumatic ulcerative granuloma with stromal eosinophilia. And the word granuloma is not a microscopic term for granuloma formation. It's a clinical term because these tend to grow initially as masses. They look like pyogenic granulomas clinically. And uh, then as time goes on, they ulcerate out and sort of become scooped out in the center. Uh, syphilis, the uh, third stage of syphilis produces granulomas, uh, granulomatous lesions in the mouth that clinically look very similar. They're called gummas.
Well, whatever it looks like, it's very similar to a squamous cell carcinoma in appearance. It's even got the rolled borders. It's got a lack of an inflammatory response. So uh, these eventually have to be biopsied. And uh, sometimes uh, the problem is that they're biopsied and they come back. They biopsied, they come back. This one came back five times. And this one came back 12 times. And uh, we never could figure out this one and teeth were irritating it. We eventually pulled the teeth and then cut it out and it never came back. This one, I never could figure out why it came, kept coming back. But uh, 12 times, that's, that's a high recurrence rate. Tugsy is uh, probably a chronic myositis as much as it is a traumatic ulcer. So it's down deep. The problem is down deep. And then we also have some things that look like uh, really bright red. Somebody smiles and you can see their, their gums glow. And this one and the next entity can look like that. This uh, is called spongiosis. I deliberately put a small power view so you can see all the white spaces. Uh, the spongiosis is pretty obvious, but maybe what's not so obvious uh, in this picture because it's kind of light is the epithelial proliferation. There's a lot of acanthosis associated with these. And the connective tissue is often uh, granulation. It looks, each one of the connective tissue papillae looks like a little pyogenic granuloma. So you might also get uh, papillary hyperplasia surface changes, but we don't usually uh, use that terminology for this. The key here is just like we seldom see eosinophils in um, oral path entities, we seldom see spongiosis in oral path entities. Even if there's trauma going on, it's, we give it different terms. It just doesn't look like the classic spongiosis that the dermatologists see. So uh, there are some changes that can be seen microscopically, CK19. If you stain one of these, it'll be very strong, cytoplasmically, whew, sorry, cytoplasmically strong compared to the adjacent uh, epithelium, but uh, I've never had to do that for one of these. It tends to be in young people as the name would be uh, would imply, but they've been found in people up to about age 40. So it's, it's not really a juvenile thing. It is always gingival. It is always producing a mass. And uh, if you have the two co combination of really strong epithelial proliferation with spongiosis, and maybe a little bit of lobularity on the surface, you've got your diagnosis. Uh, here is this, we don't know what produces these. We think it's from inflammation and then there's an abnormal immune response to something. We've not identified any bacteria or cause for this. They do tend to come back. The first one that I had, it came back in a young person four times. We were worried that it was some kind of an odd connective tissue malignancy. In that case, we were thinking of a vascular, low, very low-grade angiosarcoma. So the oral surgeon pulled the tooth and uh, it came back in the area without uh, the tooth there. So the high recurrence is a big problem with this. And sometimes you just have to cut it out and cross your fingers and it may have to heal on its own, even if, if it comes back. There may be a little bit of a papillary clinical surface change as well. Sorry, Professor Boko. Uh, yes. Uh, your lecture is very interesting, but unfortunately, we are uh, getting out of time. And uh, my, I don't know uh, how long uh, does it take it uh, from now, uh, and how uh, more time do you want uh, for? Uh, oh, I have. I, I I've told told the group that uh, I have a tendency to always have more more uh, slides uh, than I have time to talk for. So this is not, this is a topic that's never ending and I can stop anywhere. And anybody who wants to get the extra information can just ask for the PowerPoint. Should I stop now or should I go another five minutes, 10 minutes? Oh yes, I think uh, five minutes, uh, you can continue for just okay. five okay. minutes. Okay, yeah. five minutes more folks and uh, we're over and done. I wanted to point out that we have something else that looks very much like the spongiotic lesions I was just talking about, at a, clinically anyway. Sometimes it's more of a flat, but it has a little bit of a papillary or lobulated surface. It isn't obvious in this picture. But when we look at it microscopically, we just see tons of plasma cells. 
And uh, typically, in my experience, this has come from mint candies. People uh, use mint candies, uh, mint in toothpaste. Uh, it's a topical allergic reaction. And if you get rid of the topical cause, then these will, over a period of two or three weeks, slowly dissipate. Um, not all of them have that history. So there must be some cases that we, we simply don't know the cause. And uh, we just have to biopsy those and tell them you're gonna have to live with it until it goes away. It tends to come back if you biopsy it while it's active. If you just leave it alone and while it's in the fade, the fading or phasing out phase, then that will be um, a, the time to remove it. The big problem is you have all these plasma cells and uh, it could be a plasma cytoma, it, it could be a multiple myeloma. And so you have to find out if these, this is biphasic or monophasic by looking for the lambda and kappa chains. Uh, somebody asked for the presentation and the last uh, slide that I put on, I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay, so we have one or two more entities and I think that would be appropriate. Uh, let's finish up two more. These are all from the periodontal ligament in origin. So they have to be on the gingiva. You cannot diagnose a peripheral ossifying fibroma on the buccal mucosa, just doesn't happen. So uh, the ones come, coming, the tissue granulation, reactive lesions coming from the periodontal ligament are pyogenic granuloma, as I mentioned, peripheral ossifying fibroma, and peripheral giant cell granuloma. Well, the name peripheral ossifying kind of tells you what we find. We see all kinds of reactive new bone. It might be very primitive, but most of the time it's fairly uh, moderately immature. And it's generally in a pyogenic granuloma background, fairly cellular but depending on when the biopsy is made, how long it's been there, you may start to get some fibrotic tissue involved in the whole thing. Clinically, it's often ulcerated, and uh, that's going to tell you it's often lobulated as well. And that's going to tell you a lot because um, uh, irritation fibromas and, well, pyogenic granulomas are ulcerated too. So let me back off on that. This has a problem with recurrence. If you remove it and it's adjacent to a tooth and the dentist has to go and curette or scrape along the root surface to get any of the bad periodontal ligament that's exposed uh, off the root surface. And then they tend not to, to recur. If you don't do that, there's about a 15 to 20% chance of coming back. And of course, this can grow out of the socket so it can be granulomatous, uh, granulomatosum. And look at how much uh, calcification we can have for those that have remained in place for a long time. This is different from a pyogenic granuloma in that it has the ability to push the teeth aside. And also, even if all the teeth are out, here's somebody, the teeth have been out for 20 years and we see a peripheral ossifying fibroma on the surface. We know that periodontal ligament fibers remain forever, even after the teeth have been removed. And the big question is, is it osteosarcoma? I don't think I have to talk about myositis ossific cans. That's not a gingival problem. It's a muscle problem. It's a bone being formed. Typically, it looks very much like a peripheral ossifying fibroma, but it's in um, other sites, not the gingival tissue. And the last lesion I'd like to talk about is kind of important. Um, it's called a peripheral giant cell granuloma. It's from the periodontal ligament origin, as I said. So you can't use the diagnosis if it's anywhere off of the alveolar ridge. It tends to have a bluish purple lobulated surface change. Here's one that's ulcerated and even tends to look a little brownish black. So you wonder about a malignant melanoma. And these also can push the teeth out of the way. And there is a central counterpart called the central giant cell granuloma. And sometimes the central ones will perforate through the overlying cortex and an x-ray will show that there's part inside the bone and part outside. And I just call those dumbbell lesions. There's a connection between the two. But the key of course, microscopically is you have all these multinucleated giant cells and the nuclei are very similar to the surrounding stroma. And another very unique feature of this is you'll have fresh erythrocytes all over the stroma and they're not inside the, the blood vessels. There are very few blood vessels visible 
in these lesions. And you'll see some he hemosiderin here and there showing that some of these erythrocytes uh, stayed long enough to disappear and release their hemosiderin. But I'm, I'm amazed at how fresh all of this is. One of the things that you have to worry about, number one, this could be, this is the number one entity that comes out of an old extraction site. But the other thing you have to worry about is brown tumors. They look microscopically identical to this. And it's something that you just have to, for a large aggressive one or one that keeps recurring, then the hyperparathyroidism probably should be ruled out by a physician. Okay, let me get back to the beginning. And then I will read the Well, sorry, I think it's in the copyright. <clears throat> There, my very easy uh, email, I've had it for 30 years now. Uh, my last name, boco at aol.com. If anybody wants a copy of this, I will send you the link. I will put it in with my, uh, a collection that I've been doing uh, called Echo Seminars. Uh, so you'll have different topics there as well. I also uh, had a question, somebody had a question about the peripheral ossifying fibroma, whether it's reactive or a neoplasm. And I'm, I feel at least that it's a reactive lesion, but it certainly can look like a neoplastic lesion. So uh, the ossifying ossification does come from osteoblasts in that entity. They're not forming directly out of the, uh, the bone doesn't form directly out of the stroma the way it does with an osteosarcoma. Okay, so I guess that's the end of my time with you. I apologize, uh, not for running out of time because I've done that all my life, but uh, for the, uh, the problems we had with the screen. If anybody has any, uh, any questions, you can ask me at the email uh, or I'll, I'll give it back to you, Fareed. Uh, thank you, Professor Broco. It was excellent. Your uh, lecture was fabulous and really reactive lesions uh, are uh, sometimes very challenging, both for the clinician and the pathologist. And thank you very much for your uh, good presentation, for your fabulous slides. They were excellent. And uh, thank you very much. I think most of the questions was answered simultaneously uh, as you, uh, were, lecture, you were uh, doing your lecture. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, I think the audience can ask uh, other questions, questions that are not answered or uh, uh, further questions if they have, they can uh, um, uh, email you and ask you by email. Uh, also, uh, the presentation uh, can be received. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't uh, have any other comments. I would like just uh, to thank both uh, the speakers, Dr. Uh, Hanna Safar and Professor Boko, and uh, also uh, Dr. Shaki for uh, preparing this situation for us in order to take part in this uh, very interesting lecture. Dr. Shaki, uh, we are uh, ready to hear your comments. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Buko and Professor Osmude. Um, the, your presentation was uh, impressive and I do appreciate your contribution in this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of the um, lecturer, Professor Buko, Dr. Safar also, uh, uh, moderation of uh, Professor uh, Osmude. Let me give you virtually your certificate of presentation, Professor Buko, 
great Professor Buko for your uh, contribution in this uh, webinar. And also the next one, please. Well, thank you very much. But I have to uh, say that uh, at my time in life now, I don't feel great. I just feel old. <laughs> no, no, you, you are you are definitely uh, our mentor. You know, we never forget forget you, your your textbook and also your article published during um, last decades. And uh, I'm I'm very proud of being. Um, in fact, your students indirectly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank well, you I'm much. happy to help. And by the way, uh, I did mentor. She came to Texas. Um, Feruze uh, Samim is from Iran, and uh, she is now, now up in um, Montreal, Canada at Quebec University, or at University of Montreal. And uh, we got to be, she's almost like family to me. Mm. Okay, so is that it? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, would you please, uh, Miss? Okay, and here you are, Dr. Safar. Thank you for your uh, presentation and uh, impressive case presentation, challenging and uh, practical presentation. Thank you, Dr. Safar, for being with us. Uh, and also the next one, please, and Professor. Osmude, uh, for your supportive, as Dr. Safar well mentioned, your supportive attitude. We appreciate your uh, moderation in this panel and also our previous um, um, Congress on oral and maxillofacial pathology. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to ask all audience to turn on their webcam to have a group photo. Uh, I will be grateful if uh, you would turn on your, your um, webcam to see you all. Oh, it's great. Thank you for being with us uh, so far. And uh, I would like to mention that um, the last day of the course tomorrow uh, will begin uh, two hours earlier. Uh, it will start at, at half past 11 GMT. And I will be grateful. I will be grateful if you would uh, join us tomorrow again uh, at the last day and the fourth day of the course. Oh, great! Thank you very much for being with us, and uh, have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye.